topic we're going to discuss today is phases of matter gases. We talked about solids and we talked about liquids. Solids is a phase of matter where all the molecules are bound together and they can't get apart. So if you hit one molecule, it's going to go through the line very quickly to the next molecule and down the line and the molecules interact. Um, in a liquid, there's less chance for them to interact. They aren't bound together. They're loosely tied together. They work together. In a gas, there's no relationship between the molecules. There's no intermolecular forces. The only time that they come in contact with each other is when they collide. So the only forces that they experience are the forces from the collisions and the small forces from gravity that may occur. Gases have an indefinite volume and they have an indefinite shape. This means that if I have a can of pepper spray and I open it up in my house, that my whole house will fill up pepper spray. Or if you come up from school and you walk into the house, you can walk as soon as you open the door and walk in, you can smell a pie baking in the oven or cookies. That's because those gases are taking the place of, or the space occupied by the entire container. They're going to fill the whole volume up. So they have an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume. Gases do, however, have a mass. You can see here in this short GIF that the dry ice, the carbon dioxide, is actually heavier than the air. It has a mass, so it sinks to the floor. The gas also has a pressure. The pressure from the air is pushing downward on that dry ice, causing it to fall down. So there's a pressure above the dry ice from the air. So gases, although you can't see them most of the time, they do have a mass. There is a, an amount of particles, and those particles all have a mass and combine together to have a total mass for the gas. And they also create a pressure, um, and this leads us to atmospheric pressure. You can see on the picture with the helium or the hot air balloon that the atmospheric pressure is closer to the Earth's surface, is greater. That's because gravity is greater. And as you go up from the Earth, the molecules are going to be further spaced apart, and this is going to give less atmospheric pressure. That's why when you go up in an airplane, you have to have a pressurized cabin. They have to actually physically add air pressure to the cabin. Because if there's not any air pressure, then there's not enough oxygen in the air. And then if there's not enough oxygen, you lose consciousness and then you die. Uh, this is one of the common ways that pilots crash planes. When they do crash is that the cabin becomes depressurized. And if it becomes depressurized, then the, the pilots basically black out and they can't get enough oxygen and then they can't control the plane. A barometer is what measures atmospheric pressure. A barometer is basically a pool of mercury and the pressure from the atmosphere pushes down on the pool of mercury and then that mercury then pushes up the mercury in the tube. So if the mercury rises that means we have high atmospheric pressure. If the mercury drops that means we have low atmospheric pressure. So when you're talking with the weather or a meteorologist, the meteorologists always say we're in a high pressure system or the mercury has risen, this is going to bring us good weather. And if we're in a low pressure system, that means the mercury has dropped, this brings us bad weather. And these two pictures show us how that works. In a high pressure system, what happens is the molecules are drawn away from the earth. And when I say molecules, I mean the molecules that hold water next to them or in them. The water adheres to the air molecules, so it pulls them up out of the atmosphere, and it creates a nice day. Whereas in a low-pressure system, these water molecules are going to fall towards the Earth and create clouds, and this is where rain and stuff comes from. Because the water inside the air then becomes too dense, and it becomes saturated, and the buoyant force of the air can't keep the water up, and the water falls out of the sky in the form of rain. If you think about two magnets, if you pass two magnets past each other very quickly, the magnets won't have a chance to stick together. That's a high pressure system. So it's not magnets that are in the air, but water. And just like two beads of water on a glass window, if the beads get close to each other, they're going to stick together. Same thing happens in the air. In a high pressure system, the molecules are moving so fast that they don't have a chance to stick together. In a low pressure system, the molecules are moving slower. So this is like two magnets passing past each other at a slow rate of speed. They're going to have a chance to grab together. So if they grab together, then they become more heavy, heavier than the air, and they fall out of the sky in the form of rain. So low-pressure systems, bad weather. High-pressure systems are good weather. When the two pressure systems meet, 
that's when the worst weather occurs. Her tornadoes, um, heavy thunderstorms. If you ever watch the news, the weather on the news, you can see that they draw the bands on the map, and when the high pressure system meets the low pressure system, the bad weather is always along that band. A couple properties that gases have, one is Boyle's Law, the other one is Charles Law. Boyle's Law, the formula PV equals K, that means the pressure times the volume is always constant. So always when the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. Like in this piston, you can see when you compress the piston, the volume of space goes down and the pressure of the needle goes up. And when you increase the volume, you let the piston out, the pressure in the system goes down. That's Boyle's Law. Charles' Law, on the other hand, is dealing with temperature. So when you heat something up, the volume is going to expand. So when the temperature goes up, the volume goes up. When the temperature goes down, the volume goes down. You can see this if you take a balloon, blow it up, put it in the refrigerator, shut the refrigerator door, and come back in a half hour, the balloon is going to be smaller because now the air molecules are inside, are going at a slower rate, so they take up less volume because the temperature of the molecules have gone down. Likewise, if you blow a balloon up halfway and you put it in a hot room, it's going to expand, like a basketball. If you ever had a basketball and you took it out of your car and it's been in your car on a cold day, and you go into the gym and you're playing with the basketball and it seems flat, then after about a half hour the basketball is fully bouncing, that's because it's gotten hot, the molecules are moving faster, and they expand the basketball. Buoyancy, we talked about it when we dealt with, with liquids. Buoyancy also deals with gases. There's also a buoyant force in the gas. And remember the buoyant force is the net upward force on an object submerged in a fluid. Archimedes' principle deals as well. Remember Archimedes' principle said the amount of fluid displaced is equal, or the weight of the fluid displaced is equal to the buoyant force. So a steel ball in a ball shape is not going to be able to displace enough water to float. But if you pound that ball into a boat shape, that that boat shape will push the water out of the way and as it pushes that water out of the way the weight of that water is greater than the weight of the boat so the buoyant force is upward and the object can float. In terms of gases if we look first at the hot air balloon a hot air balloon you put heat into the balloon it creates hot air hot air is less dense than cold air so the hot air expands the balloon the balloon pushes the cold air out of the way. The cold air outside weighs more than the hot air inside the balloon. So the air that's displaced is the same volume as the volume of the balloon. So the balloon itself, with whatever its occupants are, weigh less with the hot air than the cold air outside that is displacing. That's what causes it to go up. Once they equal out, when the balloon equals the weight of the air it's displacing, then it levels. And when they want to drop the balloon, they cool the air inside the balloon, or they let some of the hot air out. They open up a flap and let the hot air out. So the balloon shrinks, and it comes down out of the sky. You normally see a hot air balloon in the early morning or in the evening when the air is cooler. You normally don't see hot air balloons midday in the middle of August because the air outside is just as hot as the air from the fire inside the balloon. So there's no um, difference in the weight of the air inside the balloon and outside of the balloon, and then the balloon wouldn't go up. A helium balloon, the helium and the balloon together are lighter than the air they displace. Helium itself is lighter than the air. Helium balloons float because the helium of the balloon and the helium in the balloon and the weight of the balloon are less than the weight of the air they displace. Not just because the helium is less. If I took an airtight gun safe and filled it with helium, the gun safe's not gonna float because the helium and the air surrounding it or inside of it, excuse me, the helium inside the safe and the weight of the safe are not, are still greater in mass than the weight of the air they're displacing. So you need something light like a balloon. Because this balloon is lighter, that's why it floats. Now as the balloon goes up in the air, it's going to get into lower pressure systems. So what happens is the molecules inside the balloon, they're still trying to get out. So they're pushing on the balloon walls and they're in a high pressure state. So as they push on the balloon walls, they expand the balloon. So as the balloon gets higher and higher and the pressure gets lower and lower, the balloon gets to a point that it can't expand anymore and it pops. That's why a balloon pops when it goes up. 
So if you want to get it to its maximum height, you don't fill it up the whole way. The final thing we're going to look at here is Bernoulli's principle. And the Bernoulli's principle tells us that the pressure in a fluid decreases with an increase in velocity of the fluid. So here we can see a car, and we can see the streamlines going over top of the car. Streamlines represent fluid flow. So above the front wheel, notice how the streamlines are far apart. And above the roof of the car, notice how the streamlines are close together. Well, far apart streamlines mean high pressure. Close together streamlines mean low pressure. So the air with the low pressure is going faster. So over the front tire, they want the air to go slow and create high pressure to keep that car close to the ground. Likewise, in the back, you can see with the spoiler, as the spoiler is moving up and down, how it changes the pressure in the airflow. But again, notice how the streamlines come apart as they get over the back tire. The cars are designed to create pressure over the wheels to push the wheels or push the car down and create more friction as they go faster. Here we can see some more examples. Uh, an airplane wing, notice the pressure below the wing is high, the streamlines are far apart, and the pressure above the wing is low, the streamlines are close together. This would give us a net upward force acting on the wing, and that would cause the airplane wing to take off. Same thing with the baseball, except the opposite. You can see that the streamlines are close together below the ball, far apart above the ball, so this, this ball here would be a sinker. In a tornado, what happens is all the air is moving very fast. So as it goes over your house, it's going at a great speed, which creates very low pressure. So inside your house, you have high pressure relative to outside your house. So if a tornado is coming before you go to the basement, make sure you open up all the upstairs windows. This allows all the air to move together at the same distance at the same time. So all the air will have the same velocity there won't be a pressure differential and it won't blow the roof off your house. If the pressure differential between inside your house and outside your house gets too great, it'll literally blow the roof right off your house, the pressure from the inside. Here's another airplane wing. You can see the streamlines are far apart below and close together above. So below we have high pressure, above we have low pressure, so this airplane wing is taking off. Another baseball, this one happens to be a riser. And then finally, these pictures here represent two ships. Notice how the two ships have the streamlines close together between them. This means that there's going to be low pressure because that water is moving much faster. So these two ships are going to collide with each other. It's just like when you're driving down the road on your motorcycle and a tractor trailer comes zipping by you. The tractor trailer is moving a great amount of air at a very fast speed, so it creates very low pressure. You, on the other hand, are moving on your motorcycle, moving a little bit of air, and so that's at a relatively low speed. So that you're high pressure compared to the tractor trailer, so you get sucked into the tractor trailer. Happens with a car and everything too. So that's just an idea of a Bernoulli's. When the pressure in the system goes down, the velocity goes up. One final example is in your house, in your home plumbing. If you have a leak at a joint in your plumbing, uh, and there's a drip coming out of it. If you turn all the faucets on inside your house, it's going to get rid of that leak because now the water is moving faster through the pipes and it creates less pressure against the walls of the container. Whereas if you turn all the faucets off, now the water has nowhere to go. So now it creates a pressure against that joint and that's where your leak comes from.